The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, welcome to the Engine Room Podcast. My name's Andrew Rocks, and you're in for a real treat today. I've got the dynamic duo from Osterbrokers Life with me. They're going to regale you about where their business is today and where they see it's going to be in the future. Without any further ado, we've got Ben Donald and we've got Sean Shaw with us today. And what I always like doing is just lifting a lid on how the hell you got here. So Sean, maybe I'll start with yourself. How did you manage to get to where you were running the practice or the business of Osbrokers Life? And, and then a subsequent question later on is how the hell you work with Ben Donald? But let's start with you. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the question, Rox. Look, I started, uh, I guess, in the industry uh, with Mercantile Mutual back in the day and did the what I feel is obligatory call center years through a few different insurers. Um, gives you pretty solid backing as far as dealing with clients and those flashing lights and unrealistic time frames. It's got a bit of Guantanamo Bay vibe about it, to be brutally honest. Absolutely. We used to have to take a spoon uh, off a shelf so we could go to the bathroom. Um, so it was an interesting experience, to say the least. From there, I um, sort of took a quick little step across to the dark side and uh, jumped into the financial advisor space. And um, after one small blip, I met up with the Osbrokers uh, financial solutions team at that time and actually started in 2006, the day um, the business started in North Sydney when a few companies came together. So from there, I walked in as a it was actually called an account executive because of the GI focus at the time and have hung around long enough that I am now the head of advice delivery and fortunate enough to work with Ben and manage an amazing team of people, uh, which really can't call it management. And throughout that, that career, which you've, 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 you've summarised very well, what were there? Was there any other key milestones? So even once you started it, because you, basically you started in a startup but of a big firm, any, any sort of key milestones or any mistakes that were made that you've learnt from? Uh, oh, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, definitely lots to have learned from. Um, I guess for me, there have been some really rock solid rules. Uh, one that actually started way back in the call centre and I've tried to impart to everybody is it's okay to tell someone you don't know the answer and go and find it. And I think that ensures that you're never set up for failure um, and also helps you because you're dealing with experts in, in each space and finding the right answers from the right people. Awesome, awesome. And um, your partner in crime, Ben, um, you've, uh, you've uh, sort of stumbled into this. When I say stumbled, you're about to regale us. Um, and I'd like to know where you've come from to um, manage to have a company allow you to operate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks, mate. It's always a lovely introduction. Um, I guess 
I'm the last person that hasn't been fired. So just by our natural <laughs> attrition, I'm here. I, uh, I started with Ausbrokers, I think, 11 years ago now. Um, and like most people, I think, like most financial advisors, I sort of fell into the industry. My, my sister, Sarah, gave me a job when I was in my second year of uni. Uh, worked as the assistant for a full financial planner in Brisbane, uh, then moved down to Melbourne, I think, and I, I still re- I, I still shudder thinking about my very first client appointment. Um, I absolutely stuffed it up and I'm really sorry. I don't remember their names, but to those clients, I'm really, really sorry. It was a really horrible experience for both of us. Um, but since then, uh, moved into risk specialist going back maybe 13 years ago. Uh, joined Ausbrokers as a junior advisor and as I say I think moved into the head of advice uh, and then more recently I think about two years ago as the managing director. And was life insurance always your passion? I mean apart from those first clients that um, if they're listening um, they're already consulting their legal team. Um, So but was life insurance because you're not not an old guy now so that wasn't naturally the most sexy part of the whole ecosystem of financial services or is it? (laughs) <laughs> Great segue. Um, yeah. I remember. I remember my first group presentation as a as a full financial planner. I was talking to a. Uh, I was in a lower socioeconomic area of Melbourne, and I was talking to uh, a number of individuals just after the GFC had hit, and I was talking to them about their superannuation. And you can imagine they weren't that pleased, especially when I show up, um, you know, still covered in zits in a in a suit that was probably my dad's, so it was a bit too big for me. Um, and tried to explain them to them what was happening with markets. Um, so that was a good baptism of a fire. But um, as I moved through sort of, I guess, uh, support and the advice, what was good about life insurance is that you have complete control of it. Um, so superannuation, you're at the behest of the markets. Um, tax strategy is absolutely wonderful. Consolidation, all that sort of thing is, is, is really good. But again, if you come into a bad year, a lot of clients won't be as happy as compared to if you have a good year. Uh, and I found that life insurance is, in my mind, it's, it's, it's really, really key because all you've got to have is, is one client who's not had insurance uh, and the wrong things happened and you realize the value of what you do all day, every day. So I'm really proud to be in, this, in the industry. I think we do an absolutely wonderful job and uh, I'm a massive advocate and happy to talk to everybody about it all the time. And Sean, when when you um, when you got into the business, were you saying that you were initially in general insurance and made your way across to life? And did you share the same sort of passion that Ben does for for covering people and and making sure that they're all protected? Uh, no, sorry, it was actually a joke because um, Os Brokers as a whole is a GI um, business and. For some reason, they decided to use the same terminology for the support staff that sat within the life space. Got it. Generally speaking, because they didn't understand a lot of what we were doing. Um, I actually started with Mercantile Mutual in the risk call center. So it was just always the the thing that I knew best, um, always really enjoyed being able to help people within that space. And when you see people that, that don't have insurance and the way things don't go all that well and then also where you see people who don't have support in the claim space from an advisor or an advising practice it can go really badly as well so and so that formulated you sort of so I get that so you would have been taking calls quite often people who were um, about to claim or on claim but they had no sort of professional advice is that right absolutely I think I got one on Christmas day because they didn't finish back in back in the days uh the call centers went right through so i remember getting one on on christmas day where someone's husband had passed away uh Mm. sort of thought they probably could have waited for a day or two but they they needed to get on with that straight away so yeah absolutely yeah so and that i suppose you know the whole ethos of ensemble is the positive evolution of financial advice, but the word advice is in there. And so being advised, and I think the the listener who's listening to this is probably doesn't need to be preached to because they're all for it. But, you know, if we can just keep promoting how being advised is just chalk and cheese from being unadvised. And with that in mind, maybe, Ben, in relation to um, Ausbroker's life, it is an unusual sort of structured business. And for, for everyone out there, maybe give them a bit of a feel for sort of when it started, um, and the role that, that, that your, your division, which is headed by yourself, um, fulfills within that ecosystem. Yeah, sure. So Ausbrokers uh, is part of a publicly listed entity called the AUB Group. Uh, their market cap, I think, is about $2 billion or so. But Ausbrokers, as, a, as I guess the sub, sub-branch or the, or the subset of AUB, they largely are general insurance brokerage. There's about 50 or thereabouts independent firms throughout the country, uh, and they all have various niches. So 
you know, there's a team in uh, Wagga that operate on a geography specialist. There's quite a few teams in Sydney that uh, specialize in industry. So, for example, Ausbrokers Aviation, you know, the bulk of their clients are, are helicopter oper- operators. Um, trade Credit just does trade credit. Um, there's Cruden and Reed just does construction. But by and large, there's if there's a risk in Australia related to general insurance, Ausbrokers can manage it. And I guess where the Ausbrokers' life came from was the, the public entity or the, or the larger um, group understanding that risk management didn't just extend to the chair, but also the person in it. And that's where I guess Ausbrokers' life comes from is, is you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can from the client um, and it's just a natural extension from the general insurance conversation. Absolutely. The helicopter doesn't fly without the person flying. Yeah, correct. So. And we've, Absolutely. Yeah, wow. We used to, this little sidebar here, we used to uh, insure, and we still do insure quite a few um, helicopter mustering pilots, and I don't know how we got it, but at the time, going back six years ago, we used to get standard rates on life insurance for blokes that were flying 20 metres above the ground at speeds I can't think of. With shotguns. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a mate, uh, Josh, not going to say your surname, but um, uh, he had a, he's had two helicopter crashes in his career as mustering, so um, probably so, uninsurable, which is why I'm not, in, not mentioning his <laughs> name at the moment. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the look, thank you very much for sharing a bit about that that background and, 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 uh, and, the, and the way in which uh, sort of the philosophy that was very much and just repeating is that that someone there's always someone who sits behind the piece of equipment or yeah. or whatnot and they need to be insured as well and that that plays very much to to your ethos surrounding making sure that you want to make sure that that person is covered and you can control the outcomes mm-hmm. okay so in relation to how you've managed to build this business um, I wouldn't mind just getting a feel for what you've said is wonderful and having you know a two billion dollar business with fifty branches, and having no doubt quite a large business, needs to have a large engine. So, Sean, in relation to the the engine room, how do you structure? So maybe start with how many ARs do you have? Uh, is it a centralized service? Are you pods, or, or, or how have you arranged it to make sense of quite a big opportunity? Absolutely. Look. Um As with any business, there's lots of growth, development and change. So we have adjusted our structure a few times um, based on numbers on on the team. Now, at the moment, we have about 10 advisors, uh, about the same number of support staff. And we also have some key additional um, members of the team, most importantly, or as importantly as everyone else, sorry, is our national claims manager who takes a whole lot of work away from both the support team and the advisors in that space. Now we work in a pod structure currently, so each advisor has a direct support and we work in a very structured way uh, currently using threads and processes through the X-Plan system. So that is, yeah. Well, and also, I actually was lucky enough to be in your office um, only about two or three weeks ago, and um, and you were just finishing a session on the amount of claims that you'd paid out. So maybe if you could tell the listeners just the scale of your business. So I'd like to know, you know, what's the number of clients, what sort yeah. of premium you're in, but then also finish with the money you've actually given out. Yeah. Um, so... As part of the structure, right, when you when you consolidate, you realize that you can achieve some greater efficiencies. And one of those areas that we found was with a, a direct claims manager. Now, there aren't many businesses around the country that have a claims manager. And I guess the, the return on, on em, uh, I guess, employing that person has been absolutely monstrous. Um, so Paul Langdale was an advisor for 20 odd years. And uh, when, when we bought the business that he was a part of, uh, he was really proud to have this big certificate from one path that I think talked about at the time 6.4 million or 10.4 million worth of claims. We'll just say 10.4, make it up. Um, but uh, the, the natural progression for him as an advisor was that he, he found the most joy in engaging with clients and insurers to make sure that the right outcome was achieved. So Paul's been integral to the team. Uh, he, he works with all of us. Now, some of our advisors choose to take a front foot with a lot of claims and have Paul do all basically the legwork in the background. Uh, and other advisors are just happy to sort of handball it straight to him. So 
Paul at any one stage is dealing with between 90 and 100 claims. Oh my God. Um, yeah, we, we had a massive spike on that in, in uh, with COVID and mental health claims, unsurprisingly. Um, but the last financial year, I think we did 37 million in claims. And this financial year, I know we're two days out still, but uh, we're tracking to finish at about $26 million worth of claims out to clients. Well, well first of all, thank you. Yeah, it's it's you know like it's a it's a, I'm sure that there's 27 million dollars worth of appreciation from yeah, from yeah. dependents and 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 also the people that have needed that to get through where they're at at the moment. And so, what does that make as far as the size of the business that you've got? Um, what 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 is the annual premium? So, and also, I've just picked up you specifically life insurance, pure play, correct? Yeah, hundred percent. Hundred percent, and and yep. what is it mainly? You've got a back book, or, or what's what's the size of the business? No, so we have uh, about fifty million in, in premium, um, and that's across sort of. I guess our our book, because we made about ten purchases over the last five years. It's quite of um, quite an amalgamation of different demographics, different geographies, all that sort of thing, because it's reflective of the Osbrokers Group. But uh, each year, I think this financial year, we're aiming for three million in new business premium. Um, and it's just it's just really enjoyable, hey. So we've got really good, strong relationships with the insurers, and we're able to leverage that on claims, on new business outcomes, uh, and all our advisors can you know split their time between managing the renewal book with a, a very schmick process in the background, uh, looking at the new business process, which I'm sure Sean will talk about um, how we get advice out to clients, and and if they choose to uh, taking a heavier part of the claims process. So, so Sean. What Ben just said is you, you've, you're hoping to do $3 million worth of new, new business as far as um, annual premium, which over 10 advisors, give or takes, 300000 each. And that might be something along the lines of, of you know, 20 to 30 or 40 new clients. Um, how does it work? What part does the, does the, does the, the risk specialist do? What part does the, the operations team do? How, how, do you, how do you get the work out? Absolutely. So the the start is to ensure that advisors can do as much client-facing work as possible. Obviously, that might be over the phone or Zoom, uh, but generally speaking, we want to keep the advisors advising, uh, engaging with clients and doing what they can. So the support team work extremely closely with the advisors. And when do they cut in? So when do they start? So our support teams start as soon as the advisor meets with the client. So effectively, they may know prior to the meeting. If they don't, they'll know as soon as the meeting's over. They're introduced straight away, so they're always a second set of hands to catch them if they have any questions or need to go from there. And then the support team just ensure the entire process runs smoothly. We've got all A's across the business with our audits this year, so everyone's doing what they're supposed to do with a really robust, solid system that runs behind them. And look, uh, it's been several years now since the the life insurance reforms have come in and and commissions have have come down, and many people have said that they've come down to a rate that makes it reasonably difficult um, for people who, who do life insurance as a as a as as an also do in their business, with the backdrop of those that that quite strict framework, which I believe is sixty percent of the annual premium initially, and 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 a uh, uh, an ongoing amount there. What? How do you guys run? Like, what? What's the key efficiency in the placing of the business? Um, is it uh, the advisor's role? Is it where you are doing the underwriting? Are you just picking good? insurance partners to work with what's or is it all of the probably a mix of all of those uh one of the really important components we have is a pre-assessment uh for the advisors to go through prior to any case coming across for advice to be created so that just ensures that we're not wasting any time with applications getting into insurer that won't be accepted or that are not going to end up exactly as the client expects the advice creation process we're generally expecting within two days that an SOA should be created and with the advisor for delivery to the client. And therefore, that makes the new business process extremely efficient and fast. The steps within the process are really structured and strong, which leaves no one with any questions about what they're supposed to do within their role and how they're able to deliver. So the relationships between our entire team are really strong and that means it all works really well together. Later on, we're going to talk about your team, but but um, that two day turnaround is probably going to you know probably shock a few people. It positively <laughs> shocked them. But is that because you've done the pre assessment? 
is that because you did the pre-assessment up front and then and then you can kind of craft the advice based on that knowledge? Uh, so the SOA delivery is based on the entire file being completely checked prior to going across for delivery. So, And um, what about the renewals? So you've got um, $50 million worth of business that has to roll over every year. Um, it, it, what, what sort of involvement, and maybe Ben, if you could answer this one, what involvement, if any, do your referring partners, being the GI, um, have with, with the renewal process? Yeah, um, we did a little test a couple of years ago where because we'd made so many purchases, what we needed to do was just get a, a, a broader understanding of what our clients thought about us as a business and our referral partners. So we we got our team to make a thousand random phone calls uh, and the sole goal of those phone calls was just to do a litmus test to see what the clients thought about us. Uh, really pleased to report that we had uh, one negative feedback and one person who just sort of said, why are you calling? So in my mind, that, that's okay as well. So I'm going to put it to, to one out of a thousand who, who didn't really want to hear from us. Um, so that was really good to, to prove to us that our clients liked us, appreciated us, uh, appreciated what we do. Uh, and then for the review book, every, every advisor's got their own portfolio of clients that they engage with. Um, and we've just done a basic demographic of, you know, A, B, C, D, depending on a few, few characteristics of that client. Uh, and it's just a, any, what's the word, a, a tiering of service levels. So, you know, every ABC client's getting a phone call, um, but every single client's obviously getting their renewal letter. And when we engage with the GI broker, uh, what we've found is, and I, I'd, I'd say this to every financial planner who's listening, um, where you can partner with other specialists because if you've got a, a business that you trust and you know the guys that run it and you know the brokers or the accountants or the financial planners, whatever it may be, uh, if that client is connected to you and them, that client is so much more likely to hang around with you. Um, and what we've found, uh, you know, it doesn't happen all the time, but when, when a client's not happy or, or is thinking about leaving, often we'll get a call from the general insurance broker who'll say, hey, you know, this particular client's not happy, you need to give them a buzz and sort it out and, and vice versa. So it strengthens, strengthens, strengthens the relationship with the client both ways. Yeah, so what you've articulated there is, although you're pure play life insurance, the, 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 more, the more positive partnerships you can put around the client, you're going to get that feedback. You know, you're going to get that feedback. You're going to have those positive outcomes. Yeah, and and I think one of the the messaging that we're trying to get our guys to understand, um, and and it's getting through now pretty well, and I want everybody to understand as well, is that um, the more services that you can offer a client, you know, you're not trying to sell anything. You're just trying to help them. Um, so we recently engaged with Lydia and Mortgage Broking, and and one of the wonderful things that they can do is basically just call up a client, go, you know, ask a couple of questions about when was the last time. Your, your mortgage was reviewed, you know, there's been a couple of rate increases here and there. And so it's just a value add service that we want to bring to our clients that the only thing that happens is it strengthens your relationship. It's great. Yeah. And look, my background uh, historically is I had, a, I had a multidiscipline practice where we did life insurance, financial planning and mortgage breaking, but um, which by the way, you can still definitely do and lots of great quality practices do do that. But I'm just seeing this evolution of, 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 of sort of specialist individuals I'm working together. Now, if I sort of like wanted to place myself inside your business, you've got um, advisors um, in all around Australia is what you've mentioned, but Sydney's your head office. Is that right, Sharon? Correct. So we had advisors around the country and they work predominantly from the, our referral partners. So the Osbroken Network, they work from their offices directly. So they're <laughs> sitting there with the referral partners. What, what percentage of the time are they in the, the broker's um, offices? Some of them four days a week um, and then alternatively because they have multiple businesses to go to, uh, one, one day or two days a week. No worries. And we were talking off, off air um, beforehand and you mentioned that, that um, you've just, you're just restructuring sort of some of the, I don't know if you call it a pod system or whatever the language is going to be, but if I'm an AR who works for you, God forbid. Um, <laughs> uh, What's my team look like? So I'm, I'm, I'm there. I've been charged with keeping a book of business on the books. I've also been charged with X number of new dollars. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a, I've got, do I have a, um, an associate advisor, a power planner? Like, how do you arrange per, per AR? Absolutely. So you have a direct support and a CSM. So we call them client service managers. Uh, effectively, because of the advice we produce, they would be called power planners, I guess, in, in other realms. 
they pull together the advice documents. So that is done in-house um, and obviously we're directly liaison with the advisor as and where required. In addition to that, we have an amazing team over in the Philippines who provide backup support to everybody and follow through with any sort of tasks that don't need to be actioned by the CSM. So free them up with more time to work directly with the advisor. Yeah, so your ARs are supported. Absolutely. Because you know, one of the, one of the um, you know, uh, and before you before you write the life insurance, you have to actually go through people's lives and and sit down with them, and whether it's a whiteboard or in front of them, and, and it's a fair bit of energy to get to that point. Absolutely. So so not having to worry as much about the execution of what you said is really positive. And and I'll come to your team and your people in, in a section coming up, and we'll talk about how you built the global team and why, and and um and that that's going to work well. Now your tech stack, uh, <laughs> I got an email through from you, and and you said. Uh, Tech spaghetti is what. Uh, so, so maybe, yeah. maybe uh, is tech spaghetti where you're at? Do you, do you just like eating spaghetti, or, or, or what made you say that? <laughs> I think he's made that comment because I'm a little bit heavier than I was before COVID. But thanks, mate. Um, Actually, can we go back to um, you, you wearing your dad's suit? Because I don't think that's going to happen anymore. <laughs> Uh, um, so tech, tech, tech spaghetti, I think that's a better way. I don't know any business that's just running one tech solution. Um, we've all got to now be, you know, I think every financial company in the world is probably running off Microsoft Excel 1997. Um, but we do that. We've got Microsoft Word, you know, X Plan, Outlook, the whole thing. And so we're, we're flicking from one piece of software to another. Um, but we've got high hopes coming into the future where uh, there's there's a piece of tech that's coming out very shortly called LifeBid and we're waiting with that with a bated breath because um, when that comes along, we should go out, go to be able to, what is it? We currently manage about five, 600, sorry, five to six million worth of premium per advisor. Uh, we should get that to over 10 million per advisor with a, with a decent piece of technology. Okay, we're going to do a timeout here, right? Because um, you can't just... Uh you can't just throw a claim like that in the middle, minute 20 odd of our podcast. <laughs> so, LifeBid, we'll put links on it. Is it yeah. so, this is, so, maybe give a little bit of a plug to what LifeBid is. Um, and if it's going to be that profound, um, it should be something that, that other people who profess to be life insurance specialists are looking at. Yeah, uh, I think there are quite a few people that are sitting there on the waiting list. I've been told that the, the number's sitting at above 2,000. Uh, and it's just one of the pieces of tech where they're they're focused on getting everybody's alignment first. So stakeholders, you know, everybody from the reinsurer, the insurer, licensee, advisor, uh, and regulator, and making sure that everybody's uh, along the journey that is reducing the cost to serve uh, at all points life insurance and practice manager too. Oh, fantastic! So, so look, we're going to put LifeBid um, in in the in the notes. We'll give a bit of a, a bit of a shout out to them there. Um, and you know, if you rush now, you'll be two thousand and one in the in the queue. But I, be, I believe they're not they're not as hot as the Taylor Swift tickets, or maybe maybe equivalent. Yeah. So, I also like to talk about when I'm painting the picture. You know, the clients and you guys are practitioners are one part of the ecosystem, but there's another part as well. You've got to deal with life insurers. So maybe I'd love to hear your philosophy because you've got such a big business, okay? For people out there, what's your philosophy and how do you work with them? Are they, are they your friend? Are they your foe? Are they your business partners? How do you view them? Um, and I'm sure a lot of them are listening. Yeah, so really love everybody. Thanks, everyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, there's, there's always the carrot and the stick approach, um, but more than anything, we just use the carrot the entire time. Um, everybody's got to remember that these guys are all professionals. They've all got their own jobs, their own pressures and all that sort of thing. And when it comes down to it, you've got to remember that the insurers are trying to do the right thing by clients uh, and by advisors. So I would encourage every advisor who's maybe raised their voice to a BDM uh, or an underwriter, maybe think about the way that you're engaging with them because the other person on the phone is is a person. And I can tell you this, if you go out of your way to do something nice uh, to them, that will have a massive return uh, later on. So uh, there you go, free tip for everybody. If you're a financial planner or a risk advisor, um, buy your underwriter a beer at, at the end of the year. Uh, take a BDM out, but focus on your underwriter and the guys in the in the team. So, you know, Tal, I think Heidi, Heidi Siver, is it, um, does a great job running her team and, and so do the guys at Zurich and a few other groups. And, and Sean, back to your, your complete genesis in this story, you were one of those people at the other end of the, the phone and, um, and, and that, probably, that approach probably would have endeared you to far more advisors. Look, absolutely, and I think that's probably why uh, it's something that I've been so strong on since, since day one. 
Being really balanced in your approach with the insurer is so very important. They, they're there to pay claims. They want to pay claims. They, they, that's what they're there to do. They want to write your business if they can, but they don't want to mess up the book. So, you know, there's a, there's a whole lot of things involved and taking the time to listen and understand and work with them is really important. We are really focused on making sure everyone in our team does the same thing. So they are coached, I guess, on, on how to ensure those conversations are positive and constructive at every point. Um, yeah, and they do an extremely good job of that. They've got really solid relationships across the board. Well, with treated with respect and humility, they become part of your team, right? Absolutely. So, Ben, with the uh, with your business, it's a publicly listed firm. It's it's serious. Um, we spoke off off air earlier, and I, I think you you actually showed me uh, that one a policy that you had. I think it was a nineteen seventies or sixties policy. Is that yeah, right? I think uh, so. We were talking about the founding of the company, and um, one of the portfolios that we we brought along with us. Uh, policy started in nineteen sixty one, and was for the sum assured of five thousand pounds. And uh, that was a holer? Was it a holer life? From- yeah, correct. Ah. Mutual, mutual life and citizens. Um, and I think we changed to the Australian dollar in 1968. So we've got a few policies going, going back pre that. So given that you've got such lineage there, um, uh, how are you licensed and, and um, what made you make that choice? Yeah. Uh, so the licensee is, is an interesting piece at the moment. I know there's a lot of movement. Um, we were with a group for well since before I joined, and we made the decision to to move across to Australian Unity maybe nine months ago. Uh, so as part of that, I effectively looked at the entire market, and some of the key points that I was looking for was obviously a commercial outcome. Um, and to be honest, at a business of our size, it was sort of six to one half dozen because everybody was willing to to have an individual rate for us. Um, they were attracted by Sean's charisma. Yeah, absolutely, was- <laughs> absolutely nothing to do with me. Thanks. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, so the commercial outcomes. Um, but I was, I was looking for uh, stability. Um, so with all the mergers and acquisitions, there's been massive increases and massive decreases in advisor numbers. And, and through experience, we know when, the, when there's M&A activity, ordinarily that leads to, I guess, challenges in the licensee and, and the service that you get from them. Um, so when we eventually landed on the group Australian Unity, one of the one of the biggest points that, that we were wanting to go there for was because we were really passionate about life insurance and it's it's really easy to be cornering about it, but we generally believe in giving people advice and, and giving advice to as many Australians and, and helping them. And I guess Australian Unity very much aligned with our core values along those. So, so they're a, a real well-being company. Um, and they they believe in it so much that the report that they produce annually that talks about well-being has actually been adopted by the World Health Organization and wow. the OECD. So it's um, it's a really standout sort of um, organization. Uh, so nice and stable, good commercial outcome, and it, and it and aligned perfectly with us now. So commercially, like I say, for pricing, it worked really, really well. But what was really advantageous for a group like ours, we've made it clear that we're a risk specialist. And so we wanted to find an opportunity to grow. And... Australian Unity historically has been a financial planning heavy licensee. And so at the first conference that we held sort of eight, eight, seven months ago, we were given the opportunity to present. And what came out of that was a number of the financial planning groups that were inside Australian Unity actually wanting to come and partner with us. So those conversations have continued. We've been referred multiple clients. um, And there are now actually financial planners in there that are looking to to sell their risk portfolios to us because we're a safe pair of hands. We've, we already deal with sort of, you know, 30, I think, general insurance partners, uh, multiple financial planners, multiple accountants, and we've got really good systems in place that means there's no cross-pollination of those clients. Uh, we've got the strength of relationship with the insurers, all the sort of things that a, I guess another professional wants to know that their client are going to be looked after well. And if I, if I think about the sort of uh, financial planner or, or authorised representative who, who sort of is thinking about their career where they are at the moment... You've already got these partnerships in place. So running your own business can be tough, especially when you've got to be everything. With with Sean in, in involved in running the back office and, and Ben involved in, in assisting bringing in partnerships and whatnot, you're really creating an ecosystem. You're almost building a Formula One team and you're just after some drivers. Yeah. 
you know, and um, and maybe we'll, we'll talk about, you know, you definitely are after some drivers. You've got lots of lots of opportunities, and and I think you mentioned before um, off air, you, you you're looking for some more people in in Sydney, um, in the Sydney office. You, you we'll talk about that at the end, but 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 having that already built, you can't underestimate the impact of that with your business. Now, what I also wanted to mention was the people. Okay, so you've built this structure. Okay, we've had a bit of an idea about sort of uh, you know the tech spaghetti. Um, you've given us some nuggets of gold with, with the, the new the new tech coming through. Um, I always like to ask this question: Why do people join you? Why do they stay? And why will they grow? Against a backdrop that both of you have been with this business sometime, and also you've got quite a few people been with this business sometime. So why do they join? Why do they stay? And why do they grow? Okay, so a lot of our team have, uh, definitely the support team, have been with us for over five years and they, many of them have come uh, referred from each other or from people that have been connected into us, which has, I guess, meant that they, they fit in with our culture and the positive environment uh, that we are. We've had a lot of people come in who really had no idea about the industry when they walked in the door. So they've done a significant amount of, of solid training and growth and, and development, which has been absolutely amazing. And, and internally, how, how do you structure your training? Just to jump in there? Absolutely. So um, I guess always the, the Tower Masterclass is a really good starting point uh, for, for anyone coming into life insurance. So we drop everyone in there. Um, we also ensure that they have access to any insurer presentations and PD days because that, that's always a really good space to, to learn and grow. We provide on-the-job training, uh, direct training. We also, uh, given the importance of Excel in the business world, we, uh, we've, we've even sent them off, um, sent some of the team off on, on Excel training sessions, which you know will continue to happen because no matter what you say, um, we still seem to, to need Excel. So always um, open and available so the team all know that if they see any training pop up or there's anything they want to learn or grow on, they can... Yeah, and so just jumping point, uh, jumping in, sorry, on that uh, on that training component. All of our client service managers, uh, there is a standing offer in our business that if anybody wants to become an advisor, we will fund their education into the industry. Drop um, the mic. Yeah. Fortunately, they don't. Because <laughs> I think then they'd have to work closer with me. So no. no. <laughs> so when we talk about recruitment of of advisors. Um, over the course of um, doing the engine room, what I've discovered is, is that people, um, business owners and, and general managers and practice managers have worked out that putting a bit more effort into the recruiting process does pay dividends. So what's the recruitment process that, that you do for your, for your ARs and you know, what's different about it and what do you like about it? Yeah, uh, I think we've really adopted the philosophy of um, fire fast, hire slow. And so with our recruitment, we like to have potential team uh, team members be interviewed by quite a few of our staff just so that they the, the person coming into the business gets a, a better understanding of how our team works, get some of the different personalities, and also so we get a variety of opinions. Um, culture is is really, really key. And I think that's why, you know, when somebody joins our group, they, they end up staying for quite a while. And so getting a broad um, understanding of that individual, making sure that they get a really, really strong understanding of our businesses is, is key. So what's your culture? You both mentioned it. Okay, so so maybe summarize, it. what would you say in, in terms of the type of culture? Because culture is the way we do things around here. So what's the way you guys do things around yeah, here? So I guess we all work hard, we support each other, and we have fun while we do it is, uh, is what it comes down to. Let's talk about fun. It's, I, always, <laughs> I always like this question. Right. So... Um, Yes. How do you guys celebrate success? You know, what's, what's the definition of fun if I'm in the Ostablokas life business? Uh, it was leaving Ben locked in a panic room last week at the, <laughs> for the staff function. There's a lot of panic. Um, we, had, we had all the team come into Sydney uh, for two days a couple of weeks ago and uh, it was a, a good mix of sitting down, having some of the insurers come in and have a chat to us, our licensee to have a chat to us, talk about what our, what our year that was, the goals that we have. 
and then uh, doing what we love to do most, which is just unwinding and get to know each other a little bit better. One of the one of the challenges of our business is that we're also geographically diverse. Um, we've got guys that operate from a one man band in in South Australia. Uh, we've got I think a couple of people up in Brisbane, another one in the Gold Coast, Lismore, uh, Sydney, Canberra. Um, Geelong, Melbourne, and a few other places I don't think I can remember. But it's... Shout out to the people he's forgotten in his team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shana, if you can help me out. Yeah, Adelaide. Adelaide. There we go. Okay. Go on, love Mu- yeah. yes. <laughs> yeah, so Shout out. Yeah, um, yeah Muzzabizza apparently is Murray Bridge. It's a great little place. Um, <laughs> no, but we, we all look after each other, right? Um, a good example recently, well, not recently, but um, when the Lismore floods happened, um, we are just straight away on the phone talking to our local guy, Todd, making sure he was okay, seeing if we could do anything to help. Um, and I guess talking about the culture, uh, what we offered, well, what we said to him, he's a volunteer firefighter in the area, is we said, mate, take whatever time off you want. Don't worry about leave or anything like that. We'll look after you. Just do the right thing and help out your local community. Um, and it's something we encourage all our staff to do. And which is awesome, by the way. And, and just, just looping back on, on how you get your peers to be involved in the recruitment process. So take me through that and... Have there been many instances where there's been disagreement? Yeah, so uh, two of the team in Sydney, uh, Rose started with us, I don't know how long ago, maybe five or something years ago. Uh, she went to the UK for a year, just uh, as young people do, they, they they go off. And then what was lovely is when she came back to Australia, we offered the role and we're really glad to have her back. So it's a wonderful sort of confirmation that our culture is good because somebody that goes away to the UK and London decides, no, working at Ausbrokers is way better than London. So uh, that's great. But then uh, what she recommended was one of her best mates come join the company and Ash has been working with us uh, ever since coming on board. So for us, because the culture and, and making sure everybody gets along well is so important, what we've done internally is is got a little recruitment bonus involved. So if a staff member re- recommends another staff member, um, there's a little cash incentive there for them. Oh, beautiful. Well, it's, it's good and they've got they've got a real kind of vested interest in, in making sure that, that that works and that they're culturally aligned as well, you know. Yeah. So... Um, and uh, do you use psych tests? And um, and a lot of people do, but some people have mixed, mixed things. So maybe <laughs> yeah. just give us your feedback. Um, look, I've never scored really well on them, so I don't like them very much. <laughs> that's a reflection of me, I think. Okay. But, so this um, is not your therapy session, <laughs> Ben. That's, uh, it, yeah, that's, we'd, we'd need longer than 45 yeah. minutes. And, and I, need a, I need a binding legal agreement. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so we have done psych tests in the past. Um, one, of the, one of the funny points recently um, is we were talking to Angela Liu, one of our, our staff in Sydney and um, never I don't think she'd ever realised we'd used um, Striver um, I can't remember what they're called now um, but anyway they, they, they were a good uh, good uh, hunting ground for us to find uh, junior staff coming into into the company and so we did a psych test with Ange through Striver um, and it ended up being that her score wasn't that great on the psych test but ever since she's been with the company we've we've absolutely loved her so uh, a little bit hit and miss on the psych test, but yeah, Angela's a weapon. We love her. And um, well, there you go. So shout out to the, I suppose not a shout out to the strike test, but <laughs> the psych test, but um, well done, Ange. Um, now we're talking about people and it's good to have fun, but sometimes you've got to make sure they're accountable. So how do you, how do you organize sort of reviews and what's your cadence for doing that with your team? So reviews we do on a half yearly basis. Uh, We jump in and look at how they performed. There's a big component uh, that relates back to the direct relationship with their advisor and how they're delivering because there are multiple reasons why, you know, numbers on a, on a spreadsheet don't necessarily tell the entire story. So we're, we're very, it's very important to keep the engagement holistic and constructive. So we, so just going to, Jump in quickly. Um, there's a there's a piece of tech as we use as well. Um, well, I encourage everybody to have a quick look at called Office Vibe, um, and it's a weekly check in with all staff that effectively just asks relatively random questions, and from those questions uh, they pull together scores on things like collaboration with peers, um, autonomy, 
engagement with manager, all that sort of thing. And so we see that on a weekly basis. And when we see a drop, we drill down into why that might be. So as much as we have the formal half yearly reviews, I, I think review and, and feedback is best done on the spot and constantly. And uh, that's the system that we've got in play to help us with that at the moment. No, I love Office 5. I used it at my practice. And the thing about it is, is that if you just ask someone the question on their six monthly, you're going to get a bullshit. Right. But Office Five, I believe, comes out relatively regularly. And so, um, you know, if you are a sociopath and you want to lie once, maybe twice, three, but once you get about four or five or six or seven of them, you're going to actually get the truth. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a good function in there as well that allows, um, allows your team members, sorry, to come back with autonomous, uh, sorry, uh, anonymous questions. Um, and the feedback on that has always been pretty good because, you know, what could we do to make the office better? Or we could introduce baby goats, which is, <laughs> is always a positive. And judging by the laugh, I know who put that one in. <laughs> yeah, the kid. you got more than one. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, um, yeah, no, that works really well. And when you mentioned your, your half yearlies, and we, 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 we riffed before this and you were talking about uh, the concept of structured spontaneity, but in essence... Surely your business has a set of critical numbers that you share with your team on a pretty regular basis and they're part of your DNA. So with that in mind, Ben, what, what are what is what are your critical numbers and, 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 and how do you cascade them through the team? Yeah, so um, I'll start off with the the bigger ones. So every month we've got a report in from Paul about what the claims have done. Now that's not necessarily about um, individual performance, but it's just a good sort of uh, reminder to everybody about why we do what we do. Uh, and then on a weekly basis, we have an email come in uh, that talks about new business production. And that's effectively got uh, just some nice pretty flow charts on there that you can have a glance at. And then it's got an attachment to it that you can drill down and you can have a look at basically every single client that you've got in the advice process from f- first referral through to policy completed through the year. So... And is, is that an, at an individual level? Can everyone see everyone else's activity? Yeah, it's 100% transparent. So everybody can see everything. Um, and I think that's the better way to do it. Yeah, well, it creates competitive tension <laughs> and, and also identifies even within peers um, if one of your friends needs a bit of a hand or alternatively they've done some awesome things and maybe can impart some wisdom. Yeah, so we've got um, uh, two gun advisors in Queensland, Michael Dennis and Michael Fuller, um, and they, they work together really well and there's always a little a little bet between the two of them about who's going to perform better than the other. Michael, um, I imagine. Yeah, correct. <laughs> Michael kills it every time. Um, and uh, yeah, so what we do with that is is we also encourage those guys and, and the other advisors to, to talk through a little story once a month about a difficult case they had, um, some sort of learning where something went wrong, uh, an example that effectively would allow other people to learn from them. And you've been across many states, uh, starting with Adelaide, which is your favourite one. Um, So when COVID happened and everyone had to do work from home or hybrid work, probably for you having managed people not in the four walls of your Sydney HQ was okay. But going forward, what do you see sort of... Ozbrokers is it is it as a hybrid workplace where people work from home or are they working in their specific geographic locations, and and do you see that staying the same? Yeah, look, absolutely. Uh, COVID was actually really good for us because it forced us to find Zoom, and actually having start having uh, team meetings via Zoom, which was absolutely amazing. The pigeons got tired <laughs> that to was, for ten that years. Was it, that was it. We kept, <laughs> we used to get these little um, email updates. Where there were these little videos that uh, that Ben was in, which were amazing. Um, we're going to include a couple of copies of those videos <laughs> as part of this. I think we've still got a whole library, so I'll be able to send them across. Um, so for our Sydney team, obviously, there was a bit more of an impact because everyone was in the office together uh, at that time. Now we have gone very much to a hybrid going forward. So people are able to work more or less where they choose to. We have had some people who thought working from home was amazing, but have decided that it's much nicer to be back in the office, um, even full time again. Also new starters, um, we've, we've got a recent uh, new starter, Jason, who's absolutely killing it. And he is looking hopefully to become an advisor in the next few years. So. Uh, that is one support person that, that may actually go to work more closely with Ben. 
Um, but he has been 100% in the office. And obviously new starters, it's good to have them in there and sort of pick up a bit of the vibe. And I think like many practices, the COVID really opened our minds to what can be done. And in fact, my first meeting of, of you pair was, was as part of your global team in the Philippines at, at Virtual Business Partners. And I think, I think uh, that was some initiative that you put in place during COVID um, and and may, I might have been a, a function of not being able to find people or whatnot, but but what was what was your rationale? Was it was it that or or yeah? Because it was it was right in the middle of COVID. Yeah, the um, the Melbourne lockdowns was what sort of drove I think a bit of the outcome because we were talking to our, our, our John who's down there. And I know Victoria obviously did it harder than the rest of the country. World. Uh, world, actually, you're right. Um, but uh, getting everybody on a Zoom twice a week for an hour was absolutely brilliant. So what we did is Tuesday, 11 a.m., everybody catch up uh, face-to-face or video-to-video. And we talked about business items. Uh, and then Thursday, we did the same thing at 11 a.m., but generally it was just a chat on the Thursday. And then we started doing the little trivia sessions on a Friday night where um, – I think Rose was pulling trivia together and most of us were failing really badly. So she had to make it a lot easier. So, and, and was that right now, are you doing, are you doing daily huddles with your team, with your operations team? Or, or how do you, how do you, do you run them given that you're not only in different states, you're in different countries? What, what's the, what's the cadence? Absolutely. So look, we are actually about to start um, the huddle. So a lot of our updates are sort of flowing through in July. So I'll be able to tell you in July how they start going. Um, but definitely the amazing five people we have um, with VBP, they do have a daily huddle uh, with Angela, who's the legend that we were speaking about earlier in the business, um, and make sure they're all on, on track and clear about what their day and week looks like. But I guess just, just generally with, with um, managing the team is, is you give everybody the right goals, the right tools. You don't really need to manage anymore. The best thing we do with our advisors is just get out of their way. Uh, and it's the same thing with our support. So inside a pod, I would expect an advisor and support to call each other almost constantly during the day. We've got our little uh, our teams chat. So they're always back and forth asking questions, making sure they get everything across. Um, some of our advisors will call other advisors asking questions about pre-assessments, that sort of thing to try and get an idea. Um, every now and then we'll get an email from one individual out to every staff member asking for help on a certain item if anybody's got experience. Um, and the, the daily huddles, um, it's, yeah, it's more down to the sort of twice a week for us is, is how we've done it historically. And I've, I've seen a quote that we were chatting about earlier and, um, that, and, and you mentioned, never be afraid to say, I don't know, but I'll come back to you. Clients are just people. So what was the inspiration behind that? Uh, it just, it's just the honesty of the statement. It's where we find uh, our staff have previously got in trouble or where I personally have got in trouble with clients is um, if I try and fuddle my way through an answer when really it'd be much easier to just say, I, I'm sorry, I don't know or I don't have access to the information at the moment. Just let me call you back. Um, and we encourage all our staff to have the same sort of thing internally as well. So if an advisor is calling for an answer, um, the, the, support time, the support team, for example, will understand that it's, it's much better to say, just give me half an hour and I'll come back to you. And we're talking people and culture and, and we spoke about how you recruit people into your business, but you've done something like five or six acquisitions the last couple of years. How do you absorb the people in those businesses, those people that have built their, their life insurance business into your team? Um, and is it, is it sort of a one size fits all or is every case different? generally speaking with kid gloves for a little bit um so we obviously are very understanding of where people have come from and very understanding that not everyone's going to fit into the culture or be the right people to to be in that space so obviously we do everything we can particularly with advisors to provide additional support because often the reason advisors choose to to sell the, the business and come and in, come into our team is because they want the additional back office support they want the the process that works behind them so they can just do the advising so they stay most of the time they stay and flourish is that the plan many yes absolutely yeah absolutely. so so if, if 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 i was to sort of ask you a question about you know if people are listening uh, well, if people are listening good god is this not the it's the engine room <laughs> podcast of course they're listening um but you're you're very open to not only taking on a ARs, but you're very open to to working with them to 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 
absorb their business and then let them flourish. Is that correct? Yeah, hundred percent. We have we have a lot of experience of that over the last five years, and the experience is just getting uh, I think better and better for more and more people that come on board. Uh, we're in conversations with a few people in Melbourne at the moment who I think there's one gent we're looking at uh, a business model of maybe 500,000 worth of recurring and potentially looking at a JV model. Um, and there's two other advisors actually in Victoria also who are effectively looking to sell their practice and become employees and just work off a salary. Um, so the, the world's your oyster, to be honest. We've got a, a really strong dedicated risk specialist back office team and um, we can scale up as quickly as we need to. And what I always like asking is that, that you know, it, it, you've both been in the industry more than 10 years, but maybe get a little bit of an idea, Sean, of your vision of where the practice manager or the general manager fits in a business today, as opposed to what it potentially was years ago and where you see that sort of going forward? Absolutely. Well, obviously 10 years ago, it was often the, you know, office people running around doing the bidding of the MD, uh, no really constructive way forward or process. Five to manic. Anyway, (laughs) five to nomics, I think something like that. Yes, go on. (laughs) With that walk in and drop a bomb and and walk away again. Um, Now, obviously, a, a practice manager is extremely important as as growth in the businesses are required to keep a, a team on track to keep processes humming um, and it can only need to extend from there especially as the industry continues to change and we need to keep pulling in all these updates to how we do advice and what's required so when I think about ensembles sort of what they're all about and, I'm, and and this is all about dispelling myths is that when we started ensemble it was all about financial advisors helping each other but in reality an advisor is nothing without their team you know um, they're whiteboard specialists without their <laughs> team right so so um, I would urge that that um, you know if, if you're listening to this and, you, and you're thinking of getting into and you're maybe in the back office um, to to lean on the resources that people have got because this is a genuine career Absolutely. This is not just a you're someone's assistant anymore. This is a career that, that um, you know, your, your CEO, your COO, your GM, whichever way you want to call it, are very important in running the business. They're very important in the profitability in the business, which cascades to the stakeholders. Profitability also means that you can pay for better escape rooms. One, <laughs> so, but but it, it, it makes the world go around. And, you know, obviously a positive environment. So, um Ben, with, in relation to the vision of the future, I'm going to ask you specifically in relation to the, the, the hyper-specialization of the industry. So you guys are life insurance specialists. Yep. Um, is it true that you've got referrals from other financial planners? Yeah. Uh, so that was one of the strengths of us going to or one of the ideas of us going to Australian Unity is that right. we're, we're dealing with, I think, 20 practices within uh, Australian, sorry, seven practices within Australian Unity who are referring clients to us and three at the moment who are looking to sell their portfolio of clients to us. Um, but more than that, and this is something again, we're happy to share our intellectual property on this sort of thing. So within Australian Unity, there's a couple of guys that um, have maybe 30% of their revenue coming from risk um, and they're not quite sure how to to run it better. So we're actually going down, uh, both Sean and I, to sit with uh, the, the general manager of the business and the, and the owner of the business and talk through how we might improve their processes and systems. Because ultimately, the more that we can help everybody, the better off the industry is going to be. Like We have so few risk specialists and, and so few financial planners that I don't think we're in competition with each other. We, we need to be working together to make a, a better outcome for all the stakeholders. I actually don't know the data, but it, there's, there's you know, twelve or 13,000 authorized representatives and I, I, I wonder what do you have any idea of how many would be risk specialists yeah well they said uh, I think 1500 risk specialists exist and uh, I think it was Zurich that were telling me that 159 advisors wrote 25 percent of new business last year which is a stunningly low number and I guess speaks to the point of specialization I'm, I'm glad to report that we have three of those 159 which is <laughs> which is great um, uh, so we've just got the scale to be able to, to keep growing well, that, that, that's good. And look, um, I, think, I think our industry has been in a tunnel, but I think the light is no longer an oncoming train. I think it might be the end 
of the tunnel and, and hopefully that's Fingers the crossed. Yeah. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> Fingers and toes crossed. Yeah. Well, look, I'd like to thank um, Sean. It was your first podcast today. A big Sorry. shout out. Yeah. A big <laughs> shout out. And, uh, and Ben for, for, for joining us in the engine room. Um, my objective when I was doing uh, the engine room is to find different types of businesses, but more importantly, how they then fit in together to create the positive outcomes for clients because clients are a stakeholder and the general public's a stakeholder. Um, I often wish that more people, the general public, would listen to the professionalism and the passion that we have as practitioners for their outcomes. And I'm sure over time, as as more and more positive stories come out, um, that'll be the case. Um, so with that in mind, I'd love to thank you both for being on thank the you. Engine Room podcast. Thanks, Roxy. And um, if anyone wants to reach out to you, yes. there'll be stuff in the links. Um, we're going to get some nuggets of gold there as well. And without any more, have a great time. See you guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.